So this video is important. It's about time I made it and it's about time. So in the last video I mentioned that Kali was the feminine form of the word Kala, which means time. So try to imagine all of these things together as different aspects of a complicated nexus. Your alien cortex, time, death, and money. If we're going to trace how we got into this thicket of super wicked problems, then I think it's important to realize the close connection between these concepts. I mentioned Set and how Set represents death in ancient Egypt and the mythology there, especially with the fight with Horus. You're Horus and you're doing this fight with death, Set. And by the same token, then I mentioned Kali in India, and she represents a female form of death as well. But as I mentioned before, it's really a fake imagined kind of death. It's not real death. What's really caused this super wicked predicament that we've got ourselves into is not the knowledge of good and evil. That's not what took us out of the Garden of Eden. It's a particular conception of time that we have. It's the knowledge of linear time that took us out of the Garden of Eden. And by that I mean the understanding that you have a mortal coil that's burning down and down and down till you snuff out. It's the anxiety of that conception of burning down, counting down the years to death. That's the problem. That's the root problem of all the other problems. It's not love of money is not the root of all evil. It's the knowledge of death or this perceived knowledge or a notion of a kind of death which is imaginary but still it dominates our entire world and that's the problem for mortals is time time the countdown to death so in ancient tantric tradition the idea of linear time and counting down to death was also synonymous with death and hence personified by Kali it's actually depicted quite clearly in the Kali shrines. You can find a lot of these Kali shrines, uh, particularly in rural India, uh, in Bengal in particular, where they have a lot of tantrikas. So you can see in the shrines, there are often uh, lots of alarm clocks. Uh, I, I remember seeing many sh shrines there that had a Kali, fearsome Kali statue, an idol, uh, in the shrine and on the back wall, there'd be a dozen or so alarm clocks that were wound up occasionally. Some of them weren't wound up and they had all different times on them. But I asked the priests, you know, why are there always alarm clocks uh, behind Kali? I actually knew the answer, but I was amazed that they didn't, they didn't quite know the answer themselves. The reason is because Kali's associated with time. What the shrines are doing is reminding you of your mortality, that you're counting down the hours. You're counting down the heartbeats and the breaths to your ultimate and inevitable one sure thing in life. And that's death. So that idea of linear time has come to plague us. So time is represented throughout our mythology and thinking and hence death. So death, money also. I mean, time is money. That is uh, what Benjamin Franklin said. Well, I think Donald Trump thinks he said it because his ghostwriter wrote it in his book. But anyway, time is money. So time is also life. It's freedom. And it's also your mortal coil counting down towards death. Now, this is not just an imaginary concept. It's not just a mental construct. You literally, in your DNA, you have uh, telomerase. They're basically like bindings on the end of your shoelaces. Uh, little molecular bindings that hold together a strand of DNA. So you have the classic DNA strand, uh, normally a, actually a ball. It looks more like a tumbleweed on its average day. Uh, the idea that it's a long helix, as they teach you in school, it's only that occasionally when it's uh, basically replicating. But anyway, uh, it has to have bindings at the end to hold the strand together. And those bindings are called telomeres. And they're a clock. They actually count down, a molecular clock, ticking, ticking down, 
and it's shaving, just uh, like a razor blade cutting the edge of the molecule off as it goes. It's counting its divisions so that basically you really do have an allotted clock in your nucleus. In every nucleus of every cell in your body, you have these telomeres counting down. If you could stop those counting down, you could lengthen your life. And of course, obviously, there's a lot of research into that because why? We fear time, we fear death. And so then the whole civilization project comes around, as I've mentioned before, about, about that. So, but those telomeres are nature's way of uh, deciding when we've expired. Now, that's important because it means that nature has a plan for us. Kali has a plan for us to expire. So much so that it evolved into our genes. It's not something that's accidental. It's part of the evolutionary design. Let's not go too deeply into that. Otherwise, we'll be creationists. But if uh, there is something that actually works in nature, uh, then it's often adopted by evolution. And so death has been adopted by evolution. Uh, things like lobsters are effectively eternal. They molt out of their carapace and each time they molt it gets more and more exhausting and more and more difficult for them. So they eventually die of exhaustion but they don't die of natural old age. There's, if they didn't molt out of their, their old carapace they wouldn't have to die. We have to die because of those telomeres. Uh, just the fact that they have to divide means that you have to check off time and again a cell division on this ledger that records your lifespan. So why did nature include death of the individual? Well, there are lots of types of death that nature included and none of them are really studied well because the only reason to study them is to increase your longevity, your immortality, to try and achieve immortality. But nobody studies a more obvious question is if the Darwinian theory is true, surely if there's a selfish gene, it should want to stay around for as long as possible so that it could replicate itself as many times as possible. You would think longevity would be built into the equation of survival. But in things like cell apop apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, and things like telomeres, and the countdown of telomeres, that's also a kind of programmed cell death, is why is evolution programming death into this organism? Surely that goes counter to Darwinism. Well, I'll come back to the Darwinian thing, but a good guess is that it's a counter against disease. If you take the disease theory and you say, well, let's say that, uh, let's take this horrible notion uh, that really we've got into in our thinking, particularly in the West, and that's we, we're combating disease. We have this uh, kind of combative view of disease, that we're um, fighting disease. We, you know, uh, actually, I don't think life would probably exist without viruses and disease. But anyway, we assume that uh, you know, th that's our shadow and it's all bad. Um, pathogens, disease are all bad. There's no good in them. We need to fight them. And that's our pervading myth undoubtedly wrong, by the way, but let's not go into that. Um, then, if you take that view that it's a combative thing, then you have to imagine us playing a game of cards against the viruses. They're coming up with new DNA combinations, and we're kind of countering them and <clears throat> dealing new hands. So that's probably the reason why there are two sexes and there's uh, diploid uh, progeneration. It's a way of shuffling your hand of uh, the deck of cards in your hand and by the deck of cards in your hand I mean the DNA so you shuffle around the DNA and you put that down on the table the viruses see something new and they don't quite know how to attack it so it's this game of who can present the most novelty <clears throat> where we trying to you know as an organism organism is trying to present novelty to the world the viruses are trying to catch up with that novelty and then as soon as they've nailed the novelty, then they can exploit it. They basically can be parasites on it. So we're trying to put forward random numbers. 
the virus would prefer that we just had a regular number that kept on coming out. So we, we dealt the same hand every time. If we dealt the same hand every time, then they could exploit it the same way. They could play in this game of Rochambeau or rock, paper, scissors. They would always know what to play if they always knew we played rock, paper, or scissors. They would know the response. And that's the game. Uh, if you think of the viral or um, if you think of immunology as a combative thing against viruses, then <clears throat> that's what's happening. <clears throat> so you have to imagine yourself as a human is one dealing of the cards. Now, if you last, if you last it too long, you would be an incubator <clears throat> for the viruses that had nailed your DNA combination. So it's better that people die off and leave space for new dealings of the cards in terms of the human uh, biome uh, and the human genome. So then uh, <clears throat> you keep on dealing these cards, uh, you keep one step ahead of all the viruses. And so there's a very good reason why we don't want to be immortal, uh, because that would probably wipe all of us out. It would give pathogens and viruses uh, too much of a chance. So that's a very good explanation for why we die. This uh, cell apoptosis uh, as well is it's it's very difficult for nature to make a hand. So what it does is it, it makes really a web and then all the cells in between your fingers die off. That's an easier way to sculpt uh, for, for nature. So uh, cell apoptosis is exactly the same thing. So nature would prefer that you died in place as an individual and then gave the group uh, a little chance to stay one step ahead of the viruses. So there's a bit of immunology for you. And I, I just introduced that because I wanted to say that uh, we shouldn't be thinking of death as the enemy. We shouldn't even be thinking of viruses as the enemy, but that's a different video. Okay, so now what got us into this super wicked problem, um, the civilization trap and, uh, you know, imminent extinction which is creeping towards us um, is this idea of linear time and trying to uh, really avoid these step-by-step -step progressions. Uh, as soon as I say, for example, that you know, you know, telomeres are counting down their ticking time bomb that's going to explode one day and that will be the death of the cell and death of your body, then immediately people think, oh, how do we stop that? And you shouldn't be thinking that way. You should be thinking, if that's the way nature decreed it, what's the reason? And you'll find a very sound reason, like, you know, that's the way it all works out pretty well for things like viruses. Okay, so let's not go too far off into the epidemiology. Let's go back to Set and Kali. Uh, so the idea uh, that you have an allotted time um, has start, become dominant in our culture, and that's essentially what drove the Industrial Revolution, is the clock, the clock, always the clock. So if you want social justice, if you um, want fairness in society, <clears throat> if you're just looking uh, for things, how to make green technologies work, you'd look to the clock. The computer is basically a big clock. So if you're looking for AI to save us, you're looking for the clock to save us. If you want immortality, the clock's your enemy. AI is your enemy because it's uh, it's just a big clock. It's uh, your, your alien cortex itself operates like a clock. It invented a clock to, to represent itself. So what is a clock? So a linear clock is a chronological clock. And it's really an oscillation. It's a repeating thing. So if everything worked like clockwork, which is the alien cortex's dream that, uh, you know, any fascist will make the trains run on time. And every anybody, you know, Taylorism, the idea that you, you, you make everything hyper efficient by breaking it down into tiny modules and sequence them just in time delivery. So we can have this wonderful phantasmagoria we call civilization. It all works best if it runs on time. And then, you know, the Teutonic nations, the efficient nations, they all hell bent on time. And when you come out to somewhere like Greece, um, or the Latin countries, the Arabic countries, then it drives Westerners insane because people cannot keep time. And if you can't keep time, what the hell are you doing? This, uh, you know, everything falls apart. So that idea of uh, linear time is really an oscillator. It's really something 
that is um, uh, it's a metronome that's uh, really chronologically um, executing uh, predictably. Now, in ancient times, they had two types of time. Where we've gone off the rails tremendously is because we've started to think that there's only one type of time. That's the alien cortex's type of time, and that's linear time. Here in ancient Greece, there were once two types of time. It's funny that we lost the concept of the second type of time. Because it's mentioned even in the Bible, and the Bible shaped a lot of our thinking in the West. The philosophy uh, fell out of the Bible and the monotheistic religions. So it's very strange because the Bible mentions this second type of time far more frequently than chronological time, the time that we accept as the only form of time today. So what was the second form of time? Well, let's understand the first one first. So the first form of time is Kronos. So it's the goddess, or rather the god this time, Cronus. So now scholars will tell you, no, no, since ancient times they've been confusing the god Cronos, the god of time, with Cronus, um, who's, who's another god, uh, Cronus and Saturn, I'll go into that. But they're, they're not confusing it. The scholars are confusing the fact that they're two separate gods. So who is Cronos? Cronos is essentially Father Time. If you go back to Set and the Set animal, Archaeologists are not really sure, Egyptologists are not really sure what the set animal is. They just call him the set animal. Set is actually an aardvark. So what has an aardvark got to do with this? Well, an aardvark is intimately associated in this kind of acid trip world of the ancient Egyptian mythology with death. Why? Because he has a long tongue like a scythe. Aardvarks come at night. They're nocturnal. And they cut down the ants with this long, scythe-like tongue. And so it's an image of the Grim Reaper. Kronos is time, Father Time. The guy that, you know, it's, when we sing Old Lang Syne and there's a big guy with a long white beard and a scythe, he's death, he's time, he's Saturn. So he's also Yahweh. He's the Old Testament God. The guy with the scythe and the white beard, it's the same guy. So he's Kronos. So the guy that wrote the Bible is Death, the Grim Reaper. And just like the Aardvark, he has his scythe, he cuts down all the people like ants, and that's where the metaphor comes from. So that cutting down the people like ants is time and death. The time and tide that waits for no man, and how we get cut down like a, you know, like a machine gun, a scythe in the end. That's God. That's Yahweh. That's Allah. We've personified time, Kronos, Saturn, as this tyrant in the sky. And of course, time is the ultimate tyrant. So, we made a God out of time. We put him in the sky with a white beard. Uh, he's, he's Saturn, uh, Satan, if you're a Christian. Yeah, the guy who wrote the Bible, Satan. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, you've got, on the one hand, this loving God who, who really cares for us, wants us to live and prosper. And then you have the devil who wants to deceive us. And uh, he's evil. He wants, wants, uh, wants to trick us. Question, which one of them writes a book? Pretty obvious. Satan wrote the Bible. The Old Testament God is the devil. Sorry if you're a Christian, but you've been worshipping the devil all along. And the devil is Kronos, the god Kronos. Okay, that's the one type of time. What's the other type? It's Kairos. I've mentioned this before, but there are two types of time, Kronos and Kairos. And this was in the Bible. Uh, they mention Kairos far more often than they mention chronological time. And in ancient Greece, uh, they took it as read, and still today in the culture, a lot of the problem with Mediterranean cultures that we have, uh, you know, with this Apollonian linear mindset of keep the trains running on time, is because are they thinking in terms of Kairos. Now, Kairos is a little bit difficult to explain to Westerners because uh, we've lost the concept. So let me try and explain Kairos to you. The best way to explain Kairos is is the weather. 
So, time is about the planets, uh, the zodiac, uh, you know, Saturn is often associated, and Kronos with, with the zodiac and the passing of the planets. We only know time because of the, the rotation of the Earth and the movement of planets. So it's uh, sidereal time is linear time, and that's the only time in the West. Then there's the time of opportunity, which is Kairos. It's the time of synchronicity. So synchronicity comes about when Kairos and Kronos merge together. So they mo normally decohere, and that's why when you're on a boat, you you fundamentally ruled by Kairos. Like for example, when the wind doesn't blow, you don't sail anywhere. When the wind blows, is Kairos. See, one of the reasons why green tech is a fantasy is because we're trying to make. Uh, renewable technology, so-called, uh, we're trying to use that in our chronological world, the world of Kronos. So we're trying to take Kairos and exploit it for Kronos, and it never works. Why? Because the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. And so we have to get batteries, and it's very difficult to store up that energy, put it in batteries so that Kronos can use it in a secular, regular basis. And our society runs by Kronos. It runs on the secular, regular basis. The trains have to run on time. We have to have meetings based on time. Computers run on time. It's all uh, big clockwork orange. That's where Stanley Kubik's clockwork orange comes from, is he realized deep down it's all this machinery of time. It's a clockwork world. Our civilization is this horrible clockwork mechanism. And that means it's chronological. It means it works on gears and metronomes. That's what drives the entire thing. Now, you can't get the wind and the sun and natural energy and uh, really make it regular without you know, buffering it, damming it, and using a battery, using a dam, all these kind of buffers, so that you can uh, accumulate a lot of this Kairos energy, which is really fate, uh, chance, um, propitiety, you know, it's uh, syn uh, synchronicity, um, serendipity, all those things are Kairos. So we lost Kairos in our hellbent world to try and make our world predictable, exploitable, and in essence um, to, to, to make it a slave culture. We used Kronos. So if you look at slave cultures, the central thing about a slave culture is they always have a slave bell. The very first time we started to use clocks, the first clocks were invented, they were done in monasteries. And the reason is because the, the monks themselves were just slaves. They were slaves of God and, of course, the church and, and of course, Kairos. And so to keep the regular running of a monastery, uh, to, you know, to get, make sure that prayers were done on time, the, you know, everything was made synchronous, then they worshipped Kronos and so they needed a clock. So, uh, actually, Benjamin Franklin, when he mentioned time as money, he said, well, he mentioned it in terms of a little story where he said, you know, this, this woman, uh, I think he, maybe he knew or not, maybe it was apocryphal, but anyway, the story is of a, a woman that was really understood that time is money, and her husband drove her nuts because he... Uh, he wouldn't work when you know the sun wasn't up he would you know if it rained he wouldn't work and she would say you know it drove benjamin franklin and this woman nuts that you know he was actually wasting money because of the opportunity cost that he was missing by not being uh, you know sticking to chronos he stuck to kairos uh, benjamin franklin himself when he went to france it drove him nuts the french because they worked in terms of kairos especially a, a peasant in the middle of winter, if the sun isn't shining, it's raining outside, it's cold, there's nothing to do, you stay in bed. And so that's what the peasants used to do. They would conserve energy, just hibernate on those kind of days. And Benjamin Franklin thought that this is ridiculous. You should rouse them out of bed. He even suggested to the French that they should let off a cannon at six o'clock in the morning in Paris, uh, that they should have a fusillade of cannons to wake everybody up and get them off to work. Complete obsessive uh, 
OCD, you know, I mean, it's just obsessive compulsive disorder. It's just pure alien cortex. Uh, and that was what Benjamin Franklin was all about. And we inherited his world. And so, uh, you know, we, even the thing about the daylight savings time and stuff, it's always, you know, it's, it's an, a futile attempt to try and shift things to be more closer to Cairo so you can exploit things, be more efficient. And that's what our culture is all about. So, boats in particular work uh, with Kairos. So, in terms of, you know, when it's when there's wind, you sail. Where the wind blows, you sail in that direction. Now, the continual problem I have on a boat uh, is people who live in the chron chronological world and Kronos. So, uh, the two don't go well together. And I have been trying for many years to live more in tune with Kronos, or rather leave Kronos behind, sorry, and live in terms of Kairos. So Kairos is more like relativistic time. Um, it expands and contracts. Uh, it's, it's being in the moment. In essence, Kairos is one step away from no time at all. So this, the secret to immortality is not driving chronological time to try and subdue the world. It's to go to, closer towards the Kairos form of time. And then basically you can have a moment of immortality. In meditation, uh, you are with Kairos and you are in timelessness. So, uh, you know, you can see... Uh, an infinity in a grain of sand and uh, an eternity in an hour or a heartbeat. So Einstein uh, did uh, just started to basically loosen the rigid bonds of that idea of chronological time and an inertial reference frame in the universe. Uh, and he did that with uh, relativity. Uh, he was just a plagiarist, really. He was um, he took Minkowski space time and uh, Galilean relativity and uh, this part of I, I I struggle to understand what what I, Einstein ever did that was original. But anyway, uh, we give him the credit. It was a point in history where it was conducive to making him a hero. So anyway, Einstein, yeah, Einstein. So, uh, but the takeaway is that that Einstein really shocked people to show him that chronological time was not an absolute. We thought that it was an absolute God. In, in some senses, Einstein did demote God, the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, Allah, um, uh, Jehovah. He, he did demote him from the absolute by showing relativistic time, and that was a big blow to the psyche of the 20th century. We still haven't really recovered from it. But uh, Einstein did once explain relativity as uh, saying, well, you know, when you, uh, you know, time is relative. He's, he was saying, you know, if you put your hand on, uh, on a hot stove, um, five minutes will seem like an eternity, but five minutes with a pretty girl um, seems like a very short time indeed. And he, and that uh, went down and a lot of reporters in the 1920s, they wrote that into newspapers as, oh, that's what relativity was. They're not realizing that Einstein was just making a joke. It was tongue in cheek to describe time that way. But he was really describing Kairos. So when you put your hand on a stove, the experience expands. And so Kairos or Kairic time is very flexible in those terms that he was jokingly saying was an explanation of relativity. Of course, re you know, special relativity and general re relativity are not, not that, that analogy. It was, it was just a bit of a, a joke that was Einstein was having. But, but anyway, I, I introduced that to show you the differences between these two types of time. Okay, so where does this all lead us to? Well, part of what we need to do to get out of the thicket that we're in is to get back to Kairos time. So I can only get so far on a yacht trying to get back to time as more uh, Kairos um, because eventually you come to a port or something and people want money. 
and or people come and visit the boat and you have other crew then they arrive on a certain date a flight comes in you have to be at a certain place in a certain time you have to go against the headwinds how do you do that you use a reciprocating engine a diesel engine is a reciprocating engine that cannot be more pre predictable than an internal combustion engine it's completely cyclic if it even starts to uh, gets uh, out of out of tune in terms of being cyclical the engine is broken so i have to use an engine uh, what they call the iron genoa to get to a certain place at a certain time against kairos i have to use chronos burn fuel to get to a place so i can liaise with a plane get somebody on board and then they have to get back there into this world of chronos i have to get back against the headwinds usually um against uh any sense of uh, of space and time any reasonable sense of space and time and get people back so that they meet their deadline deadline always death death associated with Kronos so I have to get them back on the deadline so that they can get on their flight and the flight of course everything has to go like clockwork because that's the world they live in I hate coming and having people come out of their clockwork world into my Kairos world and then go back into it because they they bring Kronos, uh, they bring computers, they bring clocks, um, they bring the world of Kronos into this Kairic world, and then they get very frustrated with Kairos. They say like, "What are you doing here? If you don't like Kairos, if you don't like Kairos, you don't like nature." And the truth be told, we don't like nature. Nature's unpredictable. Nature's dangerous. So people don't like Kairos. And uh, the same thing as we. Donald Trump said the reason why we can't use uh, green energy is because the uh, you know the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time and what he's saying is it's useless it doesn't fit in with Kronos the obvious thing is to say we shouldn't live according to Kronos we should live according to Kairos and then everything would be better we wouldn't be in such trouble but nobody see, knows about Kairos, so uh, it, it's lost from our vocabulary and it's lost from our philosophy, and so we're in deep trouble. Now, putting Kronos to bed is a simple thing that could achieve a lot of the social justice that people want to do the environmental justice uh, the green program all the green new deals could be achieved if you thought in more of a of the way of kairos than the way of chronos so i'm going to give you what i think the one demand all these social movements like the Sunrise Movement in America, the student debt strike, the, uh, the debt strike for climate that I'm trying to do, the, um, and of course uh, Extinction Rebellion. I think Extinction Rebellion should trash the three uh, demands that they have and they could substitute one demand, just one, and it would cover everything they're trying to do and more. So what's that demand? Well. I can tell you straight out what it is, but it's going to take some thought um, and it's going to take quite a while for you to, to go through the implications of what I'm saying. The mere fact that you make this one single demand as your only demand and just get people to think about it, this strange, odd request for a demand, just thinking and trying to understand this one single demand uh, could be enough to change people's philosophy and thinking and help us uh, get get out of the forest the super wicked forest of problems that we've got ourselves into